uh, it is 9.30. Uh, we will call the September meeting of the Wood County Board of Supervisors to order. Uh, I would ask the clerk to take the roll, and I assume he has done that already. Uh, we have two supervisors that I'm aware of right now appearing virtually, Supervisors Fire and Roser. Uh, Supervisor Roser is doing the invocation, and she will be doing that virtually. So if Donna's ready, does she look like she's ready? I have a screen where I can see her. <laughs> does she appear ready? I am ready, if you can hear oh, me. Yeah, we can hear you. So I'd ask the body to please rise for the invocation, then remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. So good morning, everybody. Good morning. If you so desire, join me in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this day. We pray for our country, state, and county for military personnel and the families that support them. Give wisdom and direction to elected officials as we serve those who elect us. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. We pray for our county department heads and employees. Let them know how much we appreciate the work that they do. Thank you for our many blessings and help us to be forever grateful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Please join the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and welcome everybody. That's our first virtual invocation. And uh, for those of you who know Supervisor Rosa well, she texted me yesterday and said, I'm going to be appearing virtually, and then I got another text saying she's supposed to do the invocation. And she said, can I do that virtually? And I said, it's up to you. And her answer was, turn it up as loud as it goes. <laughs> so, uh, Donna came through loud and clear. That works. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first thing on our agenda today is meeting from the previous session, and I have a motion to approve by Hamilton. I have a second by Bry. Um, any discussion? Changes? Seeing no discussion, all in favor, please signify by aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion carries. We have no excusals today. Um, resignations. We have a resignation of Supervisor Joe Zerflu from the Census and Redistricting Committee. Uh, I'd entertain a motion to that effect. I guess I have one by Supervisor Hamilton. And a second by David. Can you punch that in? I got it. Okay. And Any discussion? All in favor, again, please signify by aye. Aye. And opposed. And that motion carries. Under appointments, we have a couple today. The Health and Human Service Committee for the unexpired term ending April of 2024, Lori Nordman. Uh, is there any objection to me taking these together? No. No? Okay. And to the Census Review and Redistricting Committee, uh, Supervisor Wagner replacing Supervisor Zerflu. Is there any discussion? Again, I have a motion by Hamilton, a second by Hocamp. All in favor, please signify by aye. Aye. And opposed, and that motion carries. That brings us to public comment this morning, and I know we have a few people here, at least a couple, I believe, that want to speak during the public comment time. The time will be up. There's three minutes up there. Uh, we ask you to step to the microphone in the middle of the aisle there, uh, state your name, and feel free to present. Good morning. My name is Dorothy Schindelsler from Marshfield, Wisconsin. I'm here today to comment on the replies from our lawmakers. This message that I have sent to 33 Wisconsin lawmakers from the Senators, the Governor, and Marshall City Council and Wood County Board. And this is the request that I submitted. As your constituent and your boss, I demand that you do everything in your power to ban vaccine mandates and passports. This is an unconstitutional derivation of liberty due without due process and is a critical issue to me. It is unconscionable that American freedom of movement would be threatened in an attempt to coerce people to get vaccinated, even as Fauci is urging masks to be worn by the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. I will watch how you vote. Um, I'm submitting these documents because of the time. Um, I would like this placed in with uh, Mr. Trent Miner. I 
I received from Senator Vineer and others that are all positive answers. And then one came from one of your members here, Mr. Dave LaFontaine. And his answer is this, I am not, you are not my constituent. If your stupidity causes the death of a neighbor, you should be prosecuted just like a drunken driver that causes the death of a person. Also, my daughter received also from this same Dave LaFontaine, thank you for your comments. You are not my boss, but I will do you the honor of placing you on my stupid list. This is Mr. Fontaine's oath of office. This is the public misconduct of public office number 946.12. And I think that this goes right along with what I'm saying here. I think action should be taken by the ethics board I'm submitting to this for the record, on the record, so that this is looked at very closely. Thank you. Would you please walk that up to Mr. Miner? Thank you. Mr. Miner, I'll come back. Mr. Miner needs the exercise. Mr. Sir, we'll reach your halfway. Thank you. That was good. Thank you. Good work. Thank you. 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 I too have submitted a letter, um, like God's the exact same letter. I sent this generated letter to each member of the board here concerning and man uh, mandates of the vaccine for COVID because I do not believe in mandating the vaccine, especially after seeing a growing number of people being injured from the vaccine as well as vaccinated people now being affected with COVID after receiving the vaccine. This has happened in my own family, four instances. I was shocked by the response from one of the board members named uh, Mr. LaFonti, who said, thank you for your demands. I hope when you cause a death of your stupidity, you are threatened just like a drunk driver who killed a person because they were just exercising their rights. My response to him was this. You may not realize it, but I have already been to one funeral because of the vaccinations. I have an injured brother-in-law because of the vaccinations. I have a friend who bled from both her eyes and her nose after the second vaccination. This friend ended up having heart surgery because of the vaccinations. One of my daughter's friends ended up with Bell's palsy because of the vaccinations. So who's on the stupid side of the list, I asked him. Um, you are also getting continual reports, we are getting uh, reports of dis um, dis um, distant friends and their health being on the blitz. Your reply is absolutely insane, I told him and uncalled for, and especially if you are representing the people of this county. If you ask me, you are drunk with power and only care about controlling the narrative, and this is shameful. People have a right and should have a right to choose what goes in their own body. Also, I'm not saying these things, not because I want to exercise my rights, but because people I know and I love are being injured and harmed by these vaccines. I'm just a concerned citizen. And now I'm seeing 12-year-old children being vaccinated. I'm shaking because of their, this is really uh, upsetting to me. And they're ending up with heart inflammation. This is an experimental shot. And as far as we know, there has been no animal testing, continued animal testing. I would like to ask a few questions to you. Why are doctors and nurses deciding to end their careers? 
because they don't want to get the vaccination? Why are we sacrificing our children and grandchildren? Because we want to find out if the vaccine is safe or what? Also, what about, have you asked yourself, is this more population control? <laughs> or is this here about health and safety? We have time. And I have to enforce the time rule. Did you okay, want to that's, that's fine. Is there anything? Um, okay, my name is Linda Perlock. Okay, and I'm from Marshall, Wisconsin. Thank you. Is there any further public comment? Sir, approach the microphone. My name is uh, Russ Perlock, and what I want to share with you is, is some stories, unexpected stories and heartbreaking stories. On September 13th, 2021, ABC News fishing expedition on Facebook took a startling turn over a weekend after a reporter asked his readers to share their stories of loved ones who died of COVID after refusing or delaying to get the vaccine. Instead, thousands of readers reported of loved ones who died after the vaccination and even worse from adverse reactions from the vaccination. By noon on Monday, the Post had received over 39,000 angry and uh, often heartbreaking responses. Virtually every string contains a first-hand report of people whose families and members are grieving the loss of loved ones of all ages. Some of their stories. My daughter got the first dose of Moderna and then conceived a baby. My grandson was stillborn with the heart and brain malformations that the Pfizer, a, a Pfizer VP said that that could happen during the 20th and 22nd day of conception. Another, I have a friend that dies after receiving the Pfizer. He went to ER unexpectedly with tremors <clears throat> that day after. They got the tremors stopped and released him. He died the next day. Another, reports of heart attacks and strokes abound. My dad, my dad started having problems after his first shot, but was bound and determined to get the second shot. He died five days after the second shot of massive heart attack. He had no known heart problems. Another, my daughter's teacher had immediate severe reactions within 15 minutes of observation period. After that first dose, she was diagnosed with Guillain Barre syndrome and now has to use a wheelchair. How about the stories? on vaccine reactions. Another, my fully vaccinated husband and I just recovered from COVID and gave it to our unvaccinated children who we were trying to protect by getting the shots in the first place. How about covering the stories instead of producing more propaganda, so much journalism? Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? I don't see conspiracy. any other public comment, and like I said, we don't answer questions during public comment, but I, I do want a clarification to sort of A county does not have the power to issue a mask mandate to the general public. I, I'm sorry, not a mask mandate, a vaccination mandate. I want to restate that. We do not have the power to mandate vaccination to the general public. Uh, there are some workplace rules that could go into effect, but not the general public. Just so if anybody's out there watching, thinking we didn't do that. Peter, you just check the microphone. Okay. All right. Any other? I thought maybe you want to make a public comment. All right. Uh, any other public comment? All right. I don't see any. We'll go to announcements and recognitions on the agenda. We have none there. Um, we will have a special order of business. We'll wrap that after we go through the packet here. Uh, so with that said, I think from uh, UW Extension. So with that said, I think we'll get into the packet right away. Today under referrals, we have a memo from Planning and Zoning to. Uh, the Town of Grand Rapids in regard to their comprehensive plan adoption that was referred to the seed committee. And then we move into the packet on page seven, the operations committee meeting of August 17th. On pages eight, nine, and 10, we have the operations committee meeting of Tuesday, September 7th. That's eight, nine, and 10. Monthly letter of comments from the county clerk. Supervisor Winch, I apologize. There you go. I think you're on. It's on. It's on. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, on page 7, you've got an interest rate of 0.66. 
Is that a right to freedom that most freedom, Robert? It is. Correct. How come we didn't have that before? Well, we found that out when we had the sale. Uh, Ed, do you want to, do you have dates in front of you? Yeah, I got pieces of it, probably. The interest rates occur at the time of the, of the sale of the bond, so we don't know that until it occurs. It goes out to bid, and it came in at that, I guess, the lowest rate I've ever seen, uh, at 0.66%. Have they got any points or something that set it up? Did they buy that down with any points? Yeah. Is that your question? Not to my knowledge, no. I'm looking at Adam, looking at Ed Newton? No, absolutely not. Just market conditions. And then I paid uh, seven dollar budgets. Page eight is right start as it goes all the way through the whole program. We're sending a budget time. But we're not telling us whether they're over or under or even or what. They're it's sending them on. Supervisor Mary, you're to answer. All of those are explained in full at the budget meetings for every one of those uh, different departments as they lay those out in detail. Yeah, but they're not detailed to us. They are. They are. They're in the packet. They were all the budgets were in the operations packet. Right, all all of them were in there, and uh, basically we haven't got the total picture yet. We, we don't know what the total picture is. Uh, we had uh, we have one uh, one uh, supervisor on the board who makes it a point to ask each uh, uh, representative of each department when they get up there. The the uh, question that you're asking is that are you over or under budget? <laughs> he asks that uh, continually. Um, we're seeing some over, some under. Um, and we'll find out. We'll find out. Probably we've got two budget meetings coming up, one on this Friday and one on next Wednesday, and we'll have a little clearer picture of where things are, and uh, we'll be reporting back to the board and also to the uh, uh, chairs of the standing committees or the the oversight committees as to the status if if, there, if we think something needs to be changed. So anyway, we'll we'll have a little better picture after uh, next a week from tomorrow. Okay. Was that all of your questions, Bill? Yeah. Okay. All right, those are on pages 8 through 10, and then I was to the uh, county clerk's monthly letter of comments on 11, 12, and 13. Uh, page 14 through 18 is the monthly letter of comments from the Human Resources Department. Office of the Treasurer, their monthly letter of comments on 19. And then again, uh, Without objection, I'd like to take these seven resolutions together. They're all seven of these are in regard to the sale of tax deed of property back to the owner. Is there any objection to taking these resolutions as a block? No. All right, see none. Trent, please read the seven. Okay, starting on on page 20, we are at resolution 21-9-1. Authorize the sale of tax deed property back to former owner. Fiscal note, paid amount of $306.77. Next page, resolution 21-9-2, authorize the sale of tax deed property back to former owner. Paid amount, fiscal note is a paid amount of $1,896.62. Resolution 21-9-3, authorize the sale of tax deed property back to former owner. Fiscal note, paid amount of $5,393.87. Resolution 21-9-4, authorize the sale of tax deed property back to former owner. Fiscal note, Paid amount $3,333.10. Resolution 21-9-5. Authorize the sale of tax deed property back to former owner. Fiscal note. Paid amount of $1,625.67. Resolution 21-9-6. Authorize the sale of tax deed property back to former owner. Fiscal note, paid amount, $7,254.06. Resolution 21-9-7. Authorize the sale of tax deed property back to former owner. Fiscal note, paid amount of $33,430.83. All right, you've heard the reading of the resolutions. I have a motion by Supervisor Valenstein, a second by Supervisor Hamilton. Any discussion? Is there any discussion? All right, I'd ask you to please vote. Chairman. Yeah, go ahead. Just one moment before you vote. Well, or as you're voting. Go ahead. Could I just ask a question, please? You know, I look 
look at these seven resolutions and I think about the time and the energy and the effort that was made to tax feed these properties and it just kind of upsets me then that the owners come in and pay after we've gone through so much. Is there any possibility that when this happens they could be charged for some of those efforts that we made? And all the time that we took when we taxed the property. I'll answer that. Our clerk will answer that question. Yeah, change the state statutes, Representative Rosar. Well, that might be a potential legislative effort. Thank you. Thank, thank Always you. a pleasure. Now. All right, I'll allow you to keep voting, please. Supervisor Rosar, your vote is? Yes. Supervisor Fire? Give him a thumbs up if you. You got a thumbs up? Okay. All right. Okay. Those seven resolutions passed unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to back to page 27, uh, another resolution from the operations committee uh, dealing with the Wood County investment policy uh, clarifications and statutory references. The policy itself runs all the way through page 33. The clerk will please read the resolution. This will be resolution 21-9-8. Authorize the sale of tax. Oh no, we're done with that, aren't we? <laughs> to amend the Wood County investment policy to include clarifications and update statutory references. Fiscal note none. All right, I have a motion by Supervisor Rye, a second by Supervisor Hamilton. Any discussion on the resolution? Any discussion? Seeing none, I'd ask you to please vote. Roser, yes. Fire. Thumbs up or thumbs down, Michael? Thumbs up. Again, that resolution passed 19-0. All right, moving on and back at page 34 and 35, minutes of the Health and Human Services Committee from August 26th. Their minutes from September 2nd on page 36. An update from the Health Department, pages 37, 8, 9, and 40, 37 through 40, from the Health Department. Monthly letter of comments from the Human Services Department, beginning on page 41 and running through page 47. Anybody have any notes on any of those? 41 through 47. The Veteran Service Departments, their narrative, uh, pages 48 and 49. That brings me to page 50 and a resolution from the Health and Human Services Committee. This will be resolution 21-9-9 to create one FTE mental health tech position within the Human Services Department Norwood Health Center budget. The position is currently filled by a contracted staff person. Fiscal note, moving from a contracted position to a Wood County position will save the county $17,963.73 over the remainder of 2021. Okay, and I have a motion uh, by Supervisor Hamilton, a second by Supervisor Valenstein. Any questions, Supervisor Glendening? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe this goes along with the resolution uh, changing Rule 28, and that's why this can be accomplished. If, if the Rule 28 would not have been changed, um, then it would have been up to the county board to authorize this in some way or another. Thank you. Any other discussion? Any other discussion? All right, I ask you to please vote. Rosar, yes. Fire, yes. You might welcome back. <laughs> and that resolution again passed 19 0 unanimous. <laughs> Moving back to the packet, pages 51 through 55, our minutes of the Wood County Public Safety Committee of August 9th. That's 51 through 55. The Traffic Safety Subcommittee meeting, 56 and 57. Humane Officer reports beginning on page 58 and running through page 63. 58 to 63, Humane Officer reports. And then we have a preliminary draft. Uh, <clears throat> this is in regard to the uh, Memorial Bridge. I think the Sheriff's Department is not actually testifying on this about a week ago, and there's some background information there, pages 64 through 69, 64 <laughs> through 69. 
the monthly report from Sheriff's Rescue, uh, along with every other report from the Sheriff's Department, uh, beginning on page 70 and running through page... We're having fun. There you go. Again, that resolution passed 19-0. And thank you to those participating virtually. Uh, page 90 to 94, um, report from the Conservation uh, Education Economic Development Committee in regard to uh, grant applications, those run 90 through 94. 90 through 94. Questions there. Uh, seed committee, Wednesday, September 1st, beginning on 95 and running through 101. 95 through 101. Golden Sands Resource Conservation Development Council, various minutes uh, of the board as whole and its committees, beginning on 102 and running through page 110. 102 to 110. The Census Review and Redistricting Committee, Tuesday, August 17th meeting on 111. Their public hearing on Monday, September 13th on pages 112 and 113. Again, on page 114 is our monthly report from UW Extension, and we're going to have a special order of business with them later, 114 through 118. We have the staff reports from our Land and Water Conservation Department beginning on 119 and they run through pages 125, 119 through 125. 126 uh, begins the report from Planning and Zoning with Director Grunenberg's 126. And this runs all the way through page, a lot of pages, but through 151. And this is all of the uh, economic development funding requests that went along with that meeting. So extremely long, uh, detailed meeting, and then the background information, 126 through 151. Any questions? Page 152, three and four, the Citizens Groundwater Group Meeting of August 16th. Beginning on page 155, where we have the resolution from the Census Review and Redistricting Committee and the background information, all of the maps uh, that outline those districts, the supporting information goes all the way through page 174. And I would ask the clerk to please read the resolution. This will be resolution 21-9-11 to approve a tentative county board supervisory district boundary plan. Fiscal note, none. Okay, you've heard the reading of the resolution. I have a motion by Hamilton. I have a second by Bry. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? Please vote. Fire, yes. Donna, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Rosa. Thank you. And that passed unanimously. Uh, the other day at the invitation of the uh, Supervisor Glendening of the Towns Association, uh, Trent Miner appeared uh, to talk a little bit about the census in our district. And by the way, he did a really good job. I didn't have a chance to say that because he walked out of the room before I got up there. But um, Trent, do you want to outline that? Do you have that timeline in front of you or do you have it somewhat memorized? Uh, sure. Um, so starting. <laughs> Probably should have given a little heads up. Uh, a little heads up would have been appreciated, Mr. Chairman, but that's fine. So starting after today, um, the, and I'm looking at Jason, he's going to yell at me. Oh, that works good. Thanks, Ken. Um, starting today through, I believe it's October 27th, and Supervisor Curry's going to give me the handy dandy calendar to clarify that it is the 27th of October. All the municipalities need to set their ward boundaries and their aldermanic districts if they're in the city. And then on October, on November 2nd, the redistricting committee is going to meet um, and review those ward boundaries and complete the final supervisory district plan. And then at the November county board meeting, prior to probably the budget hearing, still to be worked out on that timing, um, there will be a public hearing for the finalized supervisory district plan. So um, we're working very closely with our municipal partners um, to make sure that they have all the information they need so that they can um, get all their work done in a much shortened time frame than what would normally happen during a decennial census redistricting process. Because yeah, I believe we received that data about, what, 60 days late? Roughly? Uh, probably even more, more than, than that. that. Yeah, so it was a about bit of, four or five months late. Usually we get it in April, we got it in September, so, that's or August, yeah. September, so, yeah, it, very late. So there there wasn't time for 60 days for the tentative 
plan to come forward. There isn't 60 days for the municipalities to do their work, um, and there's not 60 days for the county to do their finalized work. So, um, and this has to be done before I have to publish the Type A notice on November 23rd. So, pedal to the metal. Yeah, we're working really hard to get this done. The uh, legislature uh, looked to have an extension to have these boundaries done. The, the census work uh, prior to the next election. They were going to have this done in April or May. Uh, the governor vetoed that, uh, so we're on a tight timeline. The, the concern, obviously, are some of the smaller towns uh, you know, around the state and how quickly they can get their work done. Uh, and again, that's where the town, the municipal clerks in Wood County are extremely complimentary of the help they've received from our clerk's office. So, Trent, thank you for what you're doing there. Minutes of the Judicial Legislative Committee, September 7th, beginning on 175, runs through 177, and then there's a attendance sheet and a claim uh, with a veterinary hospital on 179. So 175 through 179, its entirety. <coughs> An update from the Child Support Agency from Director of Ruling on 180. Corp Council's monthly letter of comments on 181. Register of Deeds Office, 182. Victim Witness Services Report on 183. And then that brings us to another resolution in the packet this will be resolution 21-9-12 to change county board rule 28 so as to allow oversight committees to approve new positions of employment when the new position is due to converting a fully funded outside contract position and there will be a cost savings to the county fiscal note there will be an unknown amount of savings to departments by bringing contract positions in-house when the opportunity arises and the result is a savings in costs this is what Supervisor Clendenny alluded to earlier. I have a motion by Supervisor Clendenny and a second by Supervisor Hamilton. Any discussion on this resolution? Supervisor Fisher. Um, I, I mean, I support this, uh, but I do just want to clarify uh, one aspect. Um, and so I'm going to point this probably to Peter uh, to correct me if I'm wrong. But even though the Oversight Committee can approve this, if it is ever pulled from the minutes at a county board meeting, that position could still, in theory, be overturned, that decision. Is that correct, Peter? <coughs> Won't be able to get away with a maybe on this one. Huh? <laughs> so the county, the county board has the ability to uh, pull the minutes, as you call it, and uh, a direct action other than or differentiating from what a committee has done. If a committee's hired someone, um, then it be already and filled the position, then it becomes a little problematic. Um, so, yeah, probably the county board probably would have the opportunity to do so, but there might be problems in so far as implementing the county board's decision. Can I ask a question while I? Yeah, so first, like, would, would it not be a three quarters vote though because it is changing the rule? Um, if I can keep responding, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Absolutely. That would not be a three quarters vote because you're not changing the rule. Um, you're simply um, taking the minutes and um, saying this is not what we want to do in this instance. Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, the county board controls its own rules and could say that this is a the deviation from the rules, but your normal rule, I think it's two or three, says you can deviate from the rules and that's only a majority vote. Okay. So it wouldn't be a three quarters or extraordinary vote. Thank you, Peter. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Great. Yeah. All right, answer, please vote. Are you? Roser, aye. Thank you. That resolution again passed 19 0. Back to the packet, page 185, minutes of the HERC Highway Infrastructure Recreation Committee, 185 and 186, that's the meeting of August 18. We have a meeting on September 2nd, same committee, pages 187, 8, and 9. Report from the Highway Commissioner, monthly letter of comments on 190 through 194. We 
We have the monthly letter of comments beginning with Director Schoolies for the Parks Department beginning on 195 through 198. 195 through 198. The Property Information Technology Committee meeting August 17th and 199. Their meeting of September 8th, pages 200 through 202. 200 through 202. And then we have monthly letter of comments and updates from the Information Technology Department on pages 203, 4, 5, and 6. 203 through 206. Letter of comments from our Facilities Manager, Ruben Van Tassel, on page 207. And then we have minutes from the McMillan Memorial Library Special Board Meeting, August 4th, on page 208. Same group, they're meeting August 10th on 209. August 11th on 2.10, their Board of Trustees meeting of August 18th on 2.11, 2.12, and 2.13. Those are busy, Bill. Uh, and then we go to the uh, minutes of the South Central Library System Board of Trustees of 7.22, and that's on 2.14 and 2.15. Page 216 is minutes of the Jail Construction Ad Hoc Committee, and that's 2.16. In 217. Does anybody else have any questions or anything in the packet? Anything in the packet? All right, at this time, then we'll move forward with our special order of business. We have Jason Hausler here, the area director for extension. And Jason, I don't know if you're doing this yourself or if you have a team of people <laughs> coming up. Uh, well, he's working his way up here. Uh, this coming week, we have the Wisconsin Counties Association annual conference in La Crosse. Uh, everything right now is full speed ahead. Trent, you have some updates there? Yeah, um, for those supervisors attending on your desks this morning, please pay attention to that information because your hotel confirmation is on there. Also, my cell phone number in case something snap moves when you get there. Um, I'll be down there um, probably 3, 334, somewhere in there. So just give me a call if anything goes wrong. But all the information you need is on your desk. And then I had an update yesterday from the from the governor's office who was planning on being a tenant. Uh, if anybody's going to approach the governor, the governor would prefer that you have a mask on at that time. So that was his, I don't know, direction to me the other day when I spoke with him, or with his staff and him directly. Jason, floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Thank you, members of the Wood County Board. It's a pleasure to be here this morning with you all, uh, and I do appreciate the time. Um, so I want to share kind of some highlights from our 2020 year. I know we're almost done with 2021. Uh, but as you can imagine with uh, things this spring and in my schedule, I serve four counties. So for those that I haven't met personally, uh, I serve as area director for your extension services here in Wood County, but I also oversee the offices in Marathon, Portage, and Clark counties. So uh, with my schedule, I usually, I, uh, I think back to a couple years ago, I was with the director Schooley and we were tag team in a couple board presentations. And, uh, but I'm happy to be here this morning. Uh, you have an A report on your, on your desk. Um, it came in a separate either, uh, email from Trent Miner. I do uh, appreciate him sending that out. I, uh, um, and it's, a, it's a separate document, but you have a paper copy in, in front of you. Uh, I'm going to walk through it, not in its entirety, because I want to focus on some other things that 2021 brings us and the future of extension services, not just here in Wood County, uh, but because of some new funding through the biennium budget, the state biennium budget, that will, uh, I guess, augment the services here in Wood County and expand our, our footprint, if you will, throughout the state. So um, so I want to start with our ag educator highlights. So Matt Lippert is our uh, dairy educator, dairy and livestock educator. And we have Allison John Jack, who's our cranberry outreach specialist. So uh, the cranberry specialist position is new in 2020. We're happy to, to have that on board. It's the first of its kind around the state. And that's thanks to our oversight committee and, and Chair Curry and members of the seat committee in supporting this. So uh, as we know, Cranberry is, is Wood County's number one in cranberries uh, in the state and Wisconsin's uh, number one uh, in the country in cranberries. So extrapolation says Wood County is king in cranberries. Uh, so Allison serves uh, not just Wood County, but she serves the state. She's partially funded by Wood County um, and our extension office here, but the bulk of her stuff actually comes from our state office and their investment into, into this, uh, this new ag venture. And I'll kind of explain a little bit more of how Wood County has really been the leader in these outreach specialist positions and how they will be expanded 
in the rest of 2021 and into 2022, thanks to the work of Allison and, and, and your support here in Wood County. Um, so a, a couple of things to, to note uh, of interest, there was a lot, uh, in 2020, there was a fury of, um, I guess, just a COVID response to the ag industry and, and navigating it all for our farmers and producers was a challenge. So Matt and Allison uh, stepped up to the plate and really addressed that head on uh, from, from those farms that were dumping milk in 2020 and navigating that, that piece of the puzzle to uh, is there enough buyers uh, to internationally for cranberries? Because we ship a lot overseas. What do those markets look like? So both Allison and Matt were heavily involved in the, the COVID mitigation for the ag industry here in Wood County and, and central Wisconsin. So I can't thank them enough for, for all their work, but the other stuff didn't stop, right? So we have farmers that are putting in new automated milking systems. Uh, we brought actually just prior to, I guess, Safer at Home, brought, uh, flew somebody over from Europe to do some presentations here in central Wisconsin on automated milking systems. Uh, that's not necessarily a, the go-to for a lot of farms, but it is a supplement. So they have a, an automated machine, but then still do some in a parlor and, and that diversification, it really helps them out. Um, cranberry field trials, this is again, a, a new thing for us uh, locally. Uh, usually our state specials out of the Madison office would come up and do the field trials, but because Allison is based here out of Wood County, she was able to do a lot of field trials last year to look at disease resistance uh, to some, some pesticides, uh, looking at, uh, I guess, emerging um, insects and variations in, in fruit uh, um, varieties for cranberries. So a lot of that stuff continued in 2020 in a, in a different context. Due to supporting our, our public health uh, and Sue and, and her office, we did all the things that were necessary to conduct our programming in 2020. A lot of it was virtual, to be honest, um, but that was using the best strategies that we had at the time. Um, and so the virtual brown bank programs were well received and continue to this day. So we learned a lot in 2020 about our delivery of our programs, that face-to-face -face was always the, the best thing, right? We're gonna get people in a classroom, we're gonna deliver this content. What we found is, hey, if we can meet the farmer right at their house, and not actually have to take up too much of their time um, with, a, with a over the lunch hour, they can get back on their fields or back in the barn. Um, that was well received. So, and that included the, the, the Brown Bank programs, but also the, the Heart of the Farm program that Matt engages with, with women in agriculture. Uh, we know that women, you know, the age of saying is like, yeah, women run the farm, right? They, they keep the trains running and men are out in the fields and in the barn, but they're, they're really the heart of the farm. And that's where the name comes from. But it's women in agriculture, so we met those uh, producers where they're at too. So a couple of ag highlights there um, from 2020 and actually into today. Uh, I just talked to Allison yesterday and she, uh, her floor was littered full of, of trials, cranberry trials that she's working with the specialist in Madison. Cranberries right from here in Wood County uh, that they can then take and, uh, and do some research on. Community development, so you're all familiar with Nancy Turk. Uh, she's our community development educator. So a lot of you know Peter Manley for, for many, many years, and we're happy to have Nancy in, in that position. Um, working uh, with uh, Jason Grunenberg and planning and zoning and some other folks um, with the Ready Project, finalized the first Wood County Economic Development Plan. This is a huge undertaking that actually encompassed almost two years worth of work, I think, with that project. So um, her work really uh, kind of paved the way for, for that first plan to be created. And then uh, kind of like with Ag, Various shutdowns last year. Uh, those that have went from, uh, you know, from open to close, and how did that, how did that work with some of the, the the funds that came down from the federal government to to WEDIC to uh, you name it. To hey, now we're reopening, but our our method of of consumer has changed. Right? They want to get it on the pickup. They want to order online and get it brought to them. They want to, you know, it's the Door Dashes, it's the uh, the Uber Eats, those sort of things working with those businesses that are local to how do they expand their programming. And that's where uh, Nancy really kind of uh, found a, a, some work to do in 2020 and to today, because that's an ever evolving piece. Clean Sweep, thanks to the, the board for uh, helping to fund that. Uh, that happened up at the uh, UW Marshfield Research Station on Yellowstone Drive, another great venue, a uh, different way of delivery, but that also uh, continues. And then the, the Central Sands Groundwater Collaborative, uh, Supervisor Lightnum and, and some of the other folks are part of that. 
Nancy, along with Nathan Sandlick out of our Portage County office, helped to lead that uh, effort and continue to this day. And that's brought in stakeholders from multiple counties focusing on groundwater. And I'm happy to report as something new for 2021, it was just unveiled that, or unveiled that Extension has created a new um, agriculture water program as a result of your efforts and resolutions to, to improve groundwater, both in Wood County and the Central Sands area, and, and some other folks. And so it's a brand new program. You heard, I think this spring from John Exo and Doug Reineman at a board meeting, and their work has really paved the way for a new program. And that's a direct result of your work here on the board level to, to have extension work in the, the groundwater area. So it's a brand new program. John Exo is actually leading it with another counterpart. Uh, so it's a brand new uh, piece that I'm happy to report as a, as a direct uh, result of, of your work here uh, supporting the work of our extension educators and the Central Sands Groundwater Collaborative. So um, new initiative there in 2021. Human Development Relationships, it's the old family living program. If you're familiar with that, Jackie Caratini's position. Uh, she spent a lot of time in 2020 and even to today helping individuals and organizations cope with the, the struggles of the pandemic, whether it's loss of jobs and, and rethinking their financial uh, capabilities to, hey, my kids are, are quarantined and I don't have anybody to watch my kids, what do I do? Um, and, and stress is at an all-time high. I think numerous studies have shown that we are a stressed out society. And people have reached out to her and said, hey, our organization wants to do something with, for our employees. What can you do? Um, and it, there's a program called Taking Care of You, and it focuses on the individual as part of the collective and, and working on the stress reducers pieces. So that is, uh, she's actually doing another series right now on that um, because it, we haven't, that hasn't subsided. So um, the financial literacy, again, loss of employment, a lot of people were laid off. Some people actually got, um, I guess, stimulus money that they never had an influx of that much money in their life. And so what do you do with an influx of money instead of just spending it on, on frivolous stuff? Can you invest it for long-term strategies? So a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching, but also collective pieces. So uh, Head Start will bring in Jackie and do some work with the Head Start families um, and, and all the other organizations too, uh, United Way, um, et cetera. And then a lot of coalition work. So from coalition work to, to get food where it was needed, uh, and that's some of the gleaning projects from the farmers markets to uh, coalitions on, on eating healthy and being fit and uh, the Swept's food pantry and all those different things. She was engaged on a lot of those things because there, there was an influx. You know, one of the things that I, I learned personally throughout the last two years is the, the community engagement. Uh, while people were struggling, there was a sense of we're in this together. And there was a flurry of different things that came in. And what do we do with it all? Flurry of food uh, for food pantries, flurry of, of donated goods uh, for those that have lost jobs, like uh, apparel and uh, you know shirts and hats and shorts and whatever. She worked with coalitions to get out to those that needed. So she was highly involved in, in a lot of those things, and it continues to this day. Um, natural resources. This is Rachel Whitehair. Uh, this is a, a newer position for Wood County over the last couple of years to again focus on some of the water quality work and making sure that. We're, we, are, we are good stewards of the land, not just from an ag side of things, but even in, um, you know, for our young people, how they know where their groundwater comes from and how they have a, an impact on that. So uh, she's been working with the farmers, a farmer, uh, farmer led watershed groups, so farmers in Mill Creek, uh, farmers for tomorrow, which is in Portage County, but she's, she's half time in Wood County and half time regional through DNR. So she's got a, a wealth of resources that she can bring in from both, both sides, the extension piece and the DNR piece to really help the constituents here in Wood County make sure that we are being good stewards of the land and, and how it impacts our, our water quality. Uh, she partnered with Land and Water on the Central Wisconsin Farm Profitability Expo, uh, a great venture that way to really look at, you know, if you wanna do no-till drilling um, and, and planting, what is the profitability of that long-term? Here's the benefits for for farming, but here's also the benefits for your, your bottom line. Um, and so she's done a lot in that work with, uh, with Shane and, and Land and Water. And then lastly, telling the conservation stories of, of Wood County. So I don't know if you all know John Aaron, a uh, huge uh, uh, proponent uh, of, of good land ethic and you know the, I would say descendant of Aldo Leopold to some extent. I mean, telling the stories of conservation practices here in Wood County that 
it, people sometimes feel they're on an island. Like I'm the only one that's doing this, right? This is, this is my story. <laughs> She's helped to compile those in a video series that then people can take and move forward with them and say, hey, he's doing it. I'm gonna get on board with this too. And, and when you start, you know, so I say it's a snowball. You start, you know, building that snowball and you roll it down a hill, it gets traction, right? And that's the hope with, with telling these stories too. Um, horticulture, a huge, uh, I guess, program here in Wood County. You have some of the largest, uh, the, the largest one in central Wisconsin for sure, but even in the region of Master Gardener volunteers, donating over, uh, so we have 40 certified volunteers, not just people that, that show up at a site to do some gardening. These are certified master gardeners that have went through an extensive training and they've committed over 2,000 hours in 2020. Um, and that, that was during, you know, organizations that they used to partner with that said, yeah, we're going to opt out this year, don't come back. They still donated over 2,000 hours. So, um, uh, Rick, uh, so Janelle Ware is our Hort educator. She is uh, one of the leading people in the state in a new program called Foundations in Horticulture. This is an online program um, that was, again, a benefit of 2020 and going online is that it allows us to diversify our, our delivery instead of just all in person, you know, after hours, you have to sit in the classroom base, you can do some online with this Foundations of Horticulture program and some in person and really kind of a blend ed model. Uh, we're getting a lot of traction with that and she's been doing some great things. She started a program in 2020 that still continues right now. She's offering it, I think three times now since, uh, it's an eight week series, uh, Remain Calm and Garden On. It's a play on, uh, to, you know, remain calm and, and keep on sort of thing. And it's focusing on what kind of farming or excuse me, what kind of horticulture can you engage in, whether you live in the city or the country, with what resources you have. So she's worked with a group uh, to do some pop-up produce kits, so pup kits, and getting materials donated to then get out to the people that may have never been involved in horticulture at all. But through grant dollars, she's able to kind of infuse that energy into Wood County and, and learn some things that you know, with, I just was at uh, Fleet Farm the other day and, and the canning section, uh, canning section, it says a limit of two on, on all the canning stuff, right? Because we've all kind of went, went back from, hey, we all bought it at the store and being removed from agriculture and horticulture to, hey, everybody wants to can their own stuff, you know where their meat's coming from, and this has really had some traction in, in Wood County here. So uh, kudos to her and her work in that area. Food-wise, FoodWise is our federal program. It's no cost to Wood County. It is the, through the SNAP education dollars that come uh, to the state to then be administered through extension. We have Hannah Wendels, who's our full-time educator, and then Kelly Hammond, who's our coordinator, who serves both Portage and Wood Counties. Uh, and again, this is a 100% federally funded program. The cost to Wood County is an office space and a computer. Uh, and you get a full-time, you know, one and a half FTEs uh, through this program. So. Primarily school-based education on foods and nutrition, um, 2020 was a, was a challenge for them, to say the least. Uh, it, they weren't allowed in classrooms, a lot of virtual education. So you, the picture you see up there and in your packet is, is Hannah created a, uh, a virtual classroom um, and kind of uh, animated herself. That's almost a spitting image of Hannah. It's, it's amazing what artificial intelligence can do. Um, but then students can click at their own pace through these lessons and it helped teachers supplement their open time. So they were to say, yep, I need to, I, you know, because student, students were staying in the classroom all day. They weren't, you know, they're going outside for recess, but they weren't traveling from classroom to classroom and those sort of things. This is like, hey, I need a filler hour or I want to put this on for the next three or four weeks. We were prepackaged, ready to go. Here you go. It's uh, videos created by Hannah and the FoodWise team, uh, lesson plans, uh, take home, grab and goes, materials that were brought in, so assembling materials in our office, dropping it off at the school, and then the teachers can use that in their, in their classroom. So, um, uh, last but not least, our 4-H and Youth Development Program. This is kind of the, the, the gold star, if you will, that, that people always think of it when they think of extensions, the 4-H program. Um, again, primarily a face-to-face -face contact program through the community club programs, through our summer camp programs, through the, the fair, through a lot of different interactions that way. That was a challenge in 2020. Uh, we did see, and it's no secret, that 4-H participation around the state uh, dropped in 2020 by about uh, 25%. On the, on the flip side of it, so did FFA. So our, even our school-based programming in agriculture, FFA also dropped almost the same level. 
Now, I have to report in 2021, we re re rebounded. I don't know the ex those exact numbers right now, but we're entering a new forage program year and our numbers are up from where they were last year. So there's a dip, uh, but we're coming out on the backside stronger than we've ever been. Um, so with no in-person summer camp in 2020, we did have summer camps uh, in 2021 here with some day camps, not overnight camps, but uh, a plethora of, of day camp experiences. So we didn't have to mitigate any overnight experiences uh, in June when we were kind of coming out of some of the, the pieces. Uh, but Laura was a it was a leader in a huge program called Camp in a Box. And uh, actually has now gone on to win a, a national award from the National Association of 4-H Educators. And she'll be recognized at a conference uh, next month, I think, uh, in Memphis um, for her leadership in taking a camp experience and how do you do it virtual? You, we, you really can't do it face to face or over a screen. You gotta give them the tools and the materials to do it at home. So what you see on the picture here is our, our people that have sent in pictures of the camp experience that they engaged in um, through the dissemination of over 400 um, boxes. I think it was 400 families with more than 400 boxes, I forget. But the reach was exponential. But she was a pivotal leader in getting that program started and executed and off the ground. And um, the institu institute director, Matt Calvert, actually reached out to her just yesterday to, to, to congratulate her. And he wants to take something like that uh, and expand it statewide. So kudos to her and her work in that re regard. The, the Community Club program is strong. Again, 600 members, that's 2020 numbers, so that's down. We usually average around 700 to 750, upwards of 800. So I anticipate that's gonna keep on going up. Um, so just please know that, that we're kind of in a dip right now, but we're coming back uh, strong on the backside. And she was able to expand uh, to some new programming opportunities, so special interest clubs. And actually, these are still ongoing after 2020. One is a, is a Lego program. It's a virtual program on a Sunday afternoon. And he, I see yeah, Mr. Brian Hamilton is the same, yeah, Lego programming. Um, so on a Sunday afternoon, kids that have a, 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 a love of Legos, they can get on virtually that maybe somebody's in Marshfield and Rapids and uh, in Pittsville, whatever else. And they can build together virtually on a special interest program that they like and, and take it to the next level. And it's, and it's, it's not a commitment long term. You can come whenever it's convenient for you. You got something going on a Sunday, you can't make it this, this week, that's great. But join us next week. And so every kid has a, a different interest and this is another way for us to reach those, those youth that may feel like, well, I, I like Legos, but nobody else in my club likes, likes Legos. This is another venture for, to bring it, the county together. Um, and and there's, there's other things that, are, that she's kind of looking at um, this year, and actually, uh, actually, I'm gonna be with her tomorrow. But uh, there's a new program that she's gonna be uh, with her and our HDI educator, uh, Jackie, and some other folks, uh, uh, a, a Spanish or Latinx uh, 4-H program up in the Marshfield area. Again, the special, special, uh, I guess, special club because they're not gonna meet like a traditional community club. You know, every other month, or excuse me, once a, a month on a Monday night, it's gonna be. Uh, I guess site-based and, and it's it's different. It's it's a, it's a new way to get the principles of our 4-H program out to youth that we've traditionally never engaged with or never met. So um, kudos to her and her work in that arena. Uh, so with all that said, um, extension educators here in Wood County leverage the statewide network. So while we have educators in every uh, county, um, it's really the network that you buy into. So the work that you get here from your local educators is reciprocated through state specialists. So I go, I'll go back to the water piece. Uh, you know, John Exo and the water program has been highly engaged with Wood County at no cost to you, but because you buy into extension services, you get the, the network and that, that's an ever expanding network. And I'm happy to report that uh, in the last biennium, there was a million dollars appropriated to extension um, each of the next two years to build out this network, regional um, outreach specialists to specialize in different high needs, uh, I guess, program areas. So for instance, you know, water quality is, is a huge thing. There's a chance that there's gonna be a water quality specialist created and placed here in the Central Sands area. You know, your, your beef and livestock, you know, you look at some of the, the northern 
uh, western part of the state with some of their hog operations and, and production facilities, you know, the specialists up there may be important uh, in that regard. And actually yesterday on a WCA call, um, our Dean and Director Carl Martin and um, Heidi Johnson, our Institute Director, laid out that kind of plan of action uh, for the rest of 2021 and into 2022 uh, and engage WCA in a, in a conversation about that. So the network is expanding and uh, I can't thank you enough for your investment on a local level, but there's so much more that you're getting to that sometimes we don't see. Um, and I just wanna make you aware of that. And, and every chance I have to highlight that, I wanna make sure I do. Um, funding, I think this is the, the ultimate piece of like, well, how much does it cost and where, we get, where are you getting your money from and, and what does that look like? I think to Supervisor Winch's question, uh, our 2022 budget is projected to come under, so that's that's great. Uh, always saving the money, I think that's a that's a benefit to the county that I was able to negotiate uh, some increased state funding to offset our 4-H program. So we're coming in under budget than what we did this year. Always get good sort of taxpayer dollars, um, but it really is a 50-50 a split. Try to try to maintain that that 50-50 split. So what you see in, in your budget packet will list. Extension at you know 450,000, but a, a true cost for all that you're getting locally, not even the state specialists, which is uh, notated down below, is is half. So you pay about half time the educator, a full time educator's salary and fringes. So for a, a, a an educator, you're paying around forty four thousand dollars for a full time educator. Um, and so I know that Rule 28 change about contracted services to a county uh, position. I think this is a good testament of contracted services really being to the benefit of the county um, and saving the county dollars to, to maximize uh, your reach. So that's kind of laid out that way. Um, we do grants and fees. We try to get that up every year, uh, but some of our, some of our things, uh, some of our grant dollars are actually procured at the state level and they don't really come into the county budget, um, but we leverage those uh, from the state office that way. So we try to maintain that 50-50 split as best we can. And so that pie chart will change next year. Um, more investment from the state uh, to really maintain that 50-50 split. And then lastly, uh, leverage funding. We could not do what we do an extension without our volunteers. Master Gardener volunteers, 4-H volunteers, some of the HCE time uh, we look at. But if I do a quick calculation, I think some of uh, the 4-H volunteers would say, yep, I give five hours a month. And some would say, I give 20 hours a month to the 4-H program. But conservatively, if we do some quick calculation of our, our number of volunteers, 190 volunteers, five hours a month at 12 months, that's giving back to the Wood County community about $325,000 in volunteer service um, through what we do and how we leverage those volunteers to the benefit of our Wood County constituents. So um, with that, I wanna thank you for your time. Thanks for allowing me to the, the floor today. Um, to kind of give you a quick update of where we're at with extension and where we're going. And uh, if it's all right, Mr. Chairman, I would entertain any questions. Absolutely. Supervisor Ashback. I think we're here or not. I know it. You know, being here and being out without it, uh, our, our problem to me is out that we don't get enough information out to these farmers. Like when we introduced uh, the no-till drill to the county, every year demand is getting greater and greater for it. And we got products out there now, like they call it a pivot bio, that's a liquid you put in a corn planter, or it takes the nitrogen from the air and puts it in the corn through the microbes of the soil instead of buying commercial fertilizer. We have to we have to learn this through our feed companies. We are learning this through the county. These feed companies are way, way ahead of the colony as far as giving knowledge to these farmers. So there are things we should bring into this county that are new that we don't know about and we to go to the co-ops, to the feed companies. See. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Ashback. I, I think if I can say, I don't know if there's a direct answer to that, but uh, yesterday on that leadership call, uh, you know, Kyle Martin talked about the, the amount of dollars and the uh, effort they're going to put into extending and expanding the number of people engaged in the agriculture end of extension. And that was one of the topics on that call. Yeah. So yeah I, I think mean, that's a problem maybe they recognize. 
Yeah, exactly. So I was just going to say the almost exact same thing is we recognize that we, it's hard um, when you have a private entity, uh, as I'll call it a private entity of a co-op that can invest a job of had more money in one area than maybe we can right now. But this is going to be a, uh, a shot in the arm for extension, the, the million dollars each year to do that. And I think your point about the no-till drill being available, I think that's something we can do uh, with land and water. They have that no-till drill to, to make sure we're publicizing that more and working with land and water. Because you got products out there like wind power, uh, solar energy, geothermal, is 100% health efficient and is, done, is always renewable. It'll always be there. It is a natural resource that it's going to run out. And we haven't got enough push toward the success and stuff there. Our air and our quality in Saratoga will be much better than it would be with solar power than it will be in Weston with the power plant. And we got to dip into, push more of that into it get to their quality by with solar power and that to improve that. Supervisor Clyde Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, I'm just wondering, not to say that it's not being done, but what, what is the ag agent function nowadays? I remember when I was younger, I mean, they used to come right out to the farms and, and now they have, I, I just don't see it. And, and I think the radio to answer Supervisor Aspect's question, you know, you know, what What are you doing to advertise it? I think seeing the ag agent on the radio is is a good idea, you know, and get that message out. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, our staff are on both radio stations, WFHR out of uh, Rapids here, and also WDLB out of Marshfield. Uh, every Tuesday, uh, we rotate through educators, our ag educators on there, uh, and, and vice versa. So that's great. I appreciate that. I will let them know that you know the radio. You're listening to that. Or hopefully, you are listening to that. It's every Tuesday for an hour, um, Tuesday for the hour, and then also uh, Thursdays with WFHR. <laughs> to your question about the the ag educators' role right now, and I think that's that has changed. You're right, and that was highlighted on the WCA call yesterday. So Matt Lippert is halftime here in Wood County, halftime in Clark County, focusing on on dairy and livestock, and so. I talked about the automation. It looks different. It used to be, uh, you know, when when Extension was founded by, with E.L. Luther being the first ag educator in Nauta County over 100 years ago, it was your, I'm going to show up on your farm, we're going to do a lot of different things, and then I'm going to leave and come back and I'll check in you within a month. Farmers, what we're, what we're hearing from them is, is, we don't need you to check in on us. We need upcoming research and where we're going to Supervisor Ashbeck's question about the new things that are coming out um, but our staff do go still go out to farms uh, and have those one-on-ones if they're allowed on. I think the, the one thing that is, has prevented um, more of that one-on-one -on, -one on farm is the, the biosecurity practices of some of these larger farms to just allow anybody in their doors, and that includes our staff at times, uh, because of tight cleanliness and sanitation and those sort of things. So it's, uh, but we still do that, and a lot of it's uh, around the, the kitchen table sort of thing when they're allowed in. So good question. And, it, and it's changing too. I think that's that's what we heard yesterday is it's it's going to change. It has to change because we we can't do the same thing because we're, we're kind of behind a little bit in some of these these ag fronts because of the lack of investment in in, uh, in that area, which now we have more investment in that area. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Chairman, this is uh, Donna. I have a question. Go ahead, Donna. <clears throat> so, Jason, uh, when I'm out and about, I, I was glad to see your numbers on the 4-H program, but I have heard from certain people that they feel like there's an attempt to get rid of 4-H clubs and they're kind of disappointed in some of the support that the 4-H clubs are getting. Um, can you just comment on that? And do you see any attempt to uh, get rid of the 4-H clubs? And do you think that the new structure of the UW Extension, there's as much support for 4-H clubs in counties? Yeah, thank you, Supervisor Rosar. And, and I've heard the same thing. Uh, so I appreciate that what I'm hearing is is very consistent with what you're hearing. It also hurts my heart that that's what we're hearing. I mean, that's that's really what it is. I think what I can tell you from from my experience with with those those comments is 
What I usually hear attached to this, UW Medicine is trying to kill the 4-H program. And I think if we go back to 2019 when uh, the old organization, I'll call it the old organization of extension, which was with colleges, when colleges went to a parent institution, we went to Madison. Madison wanted cooperative extension. Inevitably, with any, with any partnership you have, right, both, both sides need to come together and learn from each other, right? So Madison was learning from extension about what we were all about, our 100 years of tradition and history. And at the same time, we were also learning about Madison's policies and procedures. And especially when it comes to youth programming at the Madison campus and their youth engagement and outreach programs, there's different policies and procedures. So how do you, how do you marry the two together? Well, during the marriage, I'll call it, there has been some trials and tribulations. And volunteers have felt, um, I guess, there's a lack of trust right there. And I'll, I'll call it what it is. There's a lack of trust right now with some volunteers of, I did this this way for 30 years, and why now do I have to change this? Why do I have to go through this uh, you know, mandated reporter training? And why do I have to go through uh, a vulnerable populations protocol? And, and why do I have to follow this policy or that policy? Well, it comes down to a lot of, uh, I guess, legal ease, you know, uh, and different procedures that we had to, to blend our old extension protocol to the future of youth programming throughout the state, and it's caused a lot of tension. No, Madison is not trying to kill the 4-H program. Let me be clear on that. We, uh, Madison is not trying to thwart community club programming, uh, you know, kill the 4-H brand. In fact, our, our chancellor, Rebecca Blank, uh, holds 4-H up as much, as much as she can to say, hey, we're involved in these programs and our specialists are integrated and should be working with the 4-H program. But I think to the, the volunteer aspect of things, Supervisor Rosa, are you, you're hearing what I'm hearing and how do we fix it? I don't have a, 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 a magic pill or a silver bullet right now to, to say this is gonna, we're gonna fix it and this is how. But it comes down to relationship building and building that trust back. I think during 2020 and a lot of our um, lockdowns and, and protocols to prevent the spread of, of COVID-19, some um, clubs really felt that they were uh, disenfranchised and not connected. And, um, and that's led to some angst. And uh, from a local level, Laura is, is doing everything that she possibly can to build back some of these programs uh, some of these clubs um, with some of those leaders and, and reestablish those those strong connections. Uh, but inevitably, when you, you have two parties that had maybe two distinct paths and you bring them together, there's going to be a, a couple of tension points throughout that, that coupling, I'll call it. And I think that's where some of the volunteers, not all of them, because there are some that are like, this is, I'm so glad that X, Y, and Z is happening. And this is for the better, for the best interest of our kids, this is happening. So that's awesome. Um, but it, yeah, I, I've heard it and I appreciate you bringing that forward and something that we're strongly working on right now as we speak in our new forage program here. So thank you and, and I will do my best to reinforce out in the community what you all are trying to do with that new program. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Any others? Doesn't look like it. Jason, thank you very much. Thank appreciate you very much for the time. In Newwood County. All right, that runs us through our regular order of business here. Is there anything else that needs to come before the board? Next meeting is October 19th, uh, same place. So with that said, I guess we will declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you.